Beyond Mix and Beyond Six International Conference, 10th anniversary program. The program was supported by the U.S. National Science Foundation, U.S. Department of Energy, the Abdus Salam International Center for Theoretical Physics, the New York University, as well as the University of Western Australia. Financial support was provided. So, Turbulent Mixing and Beyond program, it's a scientific program that has been organized with a certain goals in mind. And the goal that we had in mind when we were organizing it 10 years ago was to expose the generic problem of non-equilibrium. Those days we were saying turbulent, these days we just saying non-equilibrium and turbulent processes to a broad scientific community to promote the development of new ideas and tackling fundamental aspects of this problem, to assist in applications of novel approaches in a broad range of phenomena where this process is secure, and to have a potential impact on technology. From the very beginning, TMB program, or Turbulent Mixing and Beyond program, was a program that was established for scientists and by scientists that was established as a solely merit-based program, and that is shaped by requirements of academic credentials, novelty, and information quality. In fact, actually, we do know that we study very complex processes, and we would like to set certain standards of quality, of quality and quality criteria. TMB program was founded back in 2007, 10 years ago, with the support of international scientific community, as well as national and international funding agencies and institutions. Today, our community unites thousands of researchers from academia, national laboratories, uh, corporations, industry, at both early and advanced stages of their careers. If I would like to give some numbers, actually, for the TMB program, since 2007, as I mentioned, there was a substantial support from the direct sponsorship from the TMB, of the TMB program from funding agencies such as the National Science Foundation, Air Force, Office of Naval Research, Department of Energy, as well as institutions including the University of Chicago, NYU, Carnegie Mellon uh, University, International Center for Theoretical Physics is uh, our basic primary sponsors. Uh, uh, CEA in France, UWA, ILE, uh, Russian Academy of Sciences, as well as there is an estimate for the participant contributions because usually the funding that is being provided to us by sponsors we apply for publications and for support of those who cannot support their travel to, to the conference. There is, there is a significant part of people who are coming just for support of their own institutions. TMB conferences were organized in 2007, 9, 11, 13, and 14. They were organized as ICTP regular and hosted activities, and as well as it was once organized as a school back in 2009. It was an, also was an, once invited mini conference of the American Physical Society meeting uh, in the Plasma Physics Division in 2013, and it also invited as a symposium of the, uh, mm, uh, on interfaces and mixes by the US National Academy of Sciences, which will be held in November 2017. Since, to, since in these 10 years, we published essentially 16 books, and the 16th book that we have, it's uh, this book, and I kindly point your attention that even though it looks like very innocent, it's actually the regular publication because it has an ISBN number, and we placed this ISBN number very purposefully on this book because quite often the information, especially high-quality information that is pre presented at the conference, is sensitive. However, as long as we have an ISBN number, this information can, is a formal citation record, and as well as the, as, as, as the record. In addition to uh, these publications, of course, which have been published by the ICTP, we also publish a number of topical issues, focus issues, invited issues in physical scripta. We published with the philosoph with philosophical transactions uh, of Royal Society and Royal Society Publisher, which included same issues and edited research books. As well as we are preparing now the special feature issue in the proceedings of the National Academy of Sciences in the U.S. So, if you will Google, even though like you know it's not kind of really strict criterion, but it's still a number. If you will Google today uh, that like you know for turbulent mixing and beyond, we will find approximately uh, one million five hundred thousand results or so. I believe that this number will be dropping out sometime in the fall, but still it's a good estimate. So. TMB program, TNB conference, essentially they designed to build the bridges because uh, the conference itself provides the opportunity to bring together scientists from many different areas, including high energy density physics, plasmas, fluid dynamics, turbulence, geophysics, astrophysics, 
optics and telecommunications, and we did have these presentations uh, at some earlier stages. Mathematics, applied mathematics, probability statistics, data processing, and computations, and focus their attention on the long-standing scientific problem and as well as on the connection to reality. And why we are talking about connection to reality? Because, in fact, we do tackle fundamental problems which play important role in a broad range of phenomena and for which, actually, there are no well-designed methods. So we do need to understand how to, to formulate the standards of quality. The TMB community members, they are leading experts and researchers at advanced and earlier stages of their careers. There are also graduate students from developed and developing countries, and this mixture of senior people and younger people is quite important for the success of the program. What is important for the program is that, that it's based, it's actually a science-based program. It, uh, uh, and in, in, in the, at this conference, we, have, we found that in our communications that TMB-related problems have in common a set of outstanding research issues. The solution can significantly advance a variety of disciplines in science, technology, and mathematics. And that our community itself is a, involves participants who conduct highly innovative research, and their interaction strengthens the community mind. So non-equilibrium processes, these are processes that play a broad range, uh, a key role in a broad range of phenomena from astrophysical to at atomic scales under conditions of high and low energy density including inertial confinement, fusion, magnetic fusion, light material interaction, non-equilibrium heat transport, material transformation under impact, shocks, explosions, blast waves, supernova, accretion disks, early universe formation, stellar, planetary and non-buziness convection, uh, planetary interior, mountain litter, sphere tectonics, premixed, not premixed combustion, oceanography, atmospheric flows, non-canonical, well-bounded flows, including hypersonics and uh, supersonics, as well as in many processes in cutting-edge technology, such as laser micromachining, nanoelectronics, free space telecommunications, applications in aeronautics and uh, aerodynamics, as well as in oil and gas, gas and oil production industry. So, in fact, reliable quantification of these non-equilibrium and turbulent processes is a highly formidable task, because the theoretical description is one of the most challenging problems in theoretical physics. And the addressing complexity of this problem may expand the horizon of modern theory of partial differential equation, may encourage the development of novel perturbative integral and stochastic approaches. It's actually calling for connections, for new connections to establish between kinetic processes at microscopic scales and uh, uh, processes at uh, continuous scales. It also suggests that and actually encourages the development of new methods for predictive uh, numerical uh, modeling for the error estimate and uncertainty quantifications. If we will be discussing non-equilibrium processes on the experimental side, these are very challenging problems because they are hard to systematically study, implement, and control in a well-controlled well -controlled laboratory uh, environment due to the high sensitivity and transient character of the dynamics. And this sensitivity and transient character of the dynamics impose higher than usual requirements on the accuracy and special temporal resolution of the measurements, as well as on the data acquisition rate. And in fact, we are now returning back probably in, the, in terms of the science development to the questions that have been asked by scientists maybe a few hundred years ago. How can we ensure that essentially we are getting the opinion independent result? How can we ensure, which is a scientific result is supposed to be, how can we assure that we might eliminate the influence of an observer on the observation results as well as on the data interpretation? So, from this perspective, non-equilibrium processes is an intellectually rich and highly fascinating problem. Its exploration may have a transformative impact on our understanding of a broad variety of physical phenomena on fundamental principles of mathematical modeling as well as on the technology development. And with this idea in mind, we have been working pretty hard, I hope. We have been productive, efficient, I believe, in our studies of non-equilibrium dynamics. We have obtained and reported solid and fundamental results and have made and reported discoveries. And about this, we will be discussing, actually, during the conference, at the, at the conference sessions, as well as during the roundtable discussions and you know, the public lectures, etc. 
So, uh, we have organized now the sixth international conference 10th anniversary program. We have certain objectives in mind, which are listed here. It's uh, actually, and they are tightly connected to the goals of the problem. Our TMB conference actually consists of invited lectures that are usually like, you know, 30 to 35 minutes long, contributed talks that are from uh, 25 to 30 minutes long, from posters, there will be one round table session on Thursday, and well as open discussion. What the round table is, it's an informal discussion under which, uh, at, at the end of which we are going to elaborate an, uh, a set of action items to proceed further. And uh, in addition to the round table posters, we will have also the two competitions, which are the competitions of, for the young poster, for the young scientist award, which is here, as well as the competition for the best poster. So, as I mentioned, you know, as a community, we are a part of a TMB community that unites currently about 2,000 researchers. Our mailing list contains over 5,000 email addresses, and our community is growing while it still actually remains pretty, um, I would say, condensed, because its natural bounds are set by the requirements of academic credentials and quality of research. Now, at TMB 2017, we have about 150 people we will have 195 contributions of 375 authors, and it includes about 50 to 60 invited lectures. So our participants include students and young researchers, and 30 of them will be competing with, with their, their uh, oral presentations and uh, 30 of their poster presentations for the best uh, poster and actually TMB for you award. We have seasoned scientists, members of the leading scientific institutions, as well as the National Academy of Sciences, industry, and high tech, as well as worldwide. And then we have a, such a broad international community. One of the important words that actually drives the behavior within this community is a key word for us is essentially respect, because you know we, challenge, we study challenging problems, and we would like to be respectful to our problems, to our results, to our work, and to one another. Here's a list of the organizers of the TMB program, which includes the uh, members of the organizing committee, Young Scientist Award, Best Poster Award, as well as Financial Support Committee. There is a members of the local organizing committee here, which is Matteo Marsili, And I can ask you to applaud him. Yes. Yes. Because he, uh, while, like, you know, he, 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 he's formally will not be uh, associated with the team. Uh, so <laughs> assistance from the ICTP because this is a really a unique place worldwide and it's essentially always was and probably will be the point of east-west communication especially these days because the you know overall political situation it becomes more complex but ICTP in this situation remains the place where people really focus on uh, on, on, on scientific development regardless the country of origin gender age 
you know, at, uh, and other sense. And we would like to express our gratitude to the conference support office and Ms. Federica Del Conte, who did enormous, really, work, because organizing, you know, 150 people, it's, it's a huge work. Usually, a standard ACTP activity is smaller in size. That's one, probably one of the biggest. To financial uh, office, who usually very accurately handles all the funding that is provided by the sponsors as well as the ICTP. Uh, the visa office and Mr. Adriano Maggi, who helped many of you to get the visa on time. Housing office and Ms. Tiziana Batazzi and Ms. Elisabetta Capella. As well as publishing office and Ms. Sabrina Wiesentin and Eduardo Natelli. Computer office and Johannes Grasbenberg, who works at the ZTP for a very, very long time. And, you know, many of you might just, you know, have an internet access thanks to his help. As well as to the science dissemination unit and Dr. Enrique Caneza, Carla Fonda, and Marco Zanara. And I kindly point your attention that all the ACTP, all the presentations that will be handled here, as well as in the earlier lecture hall, they are video recorded, and they will be available online, essentially one hour after the presentation. So we essentially have a uh, live uh, broadcast. We also gratefully acknowledge the support of the National Science Foundation, Department of Energy in the US, the International Center for Theoretical Physics in Italy, the New York University, and the University of Western Australia. So TMB 2017 is organized to advance the state of the art in our understanding of fundamental physical properties of non-equilibrium processes, to have a conspicuous positive impact on their predictive modeling capability and physical descriptions, and overall to have a better control and understanding of these complex processes. As usually, the success of the TMB program, because it's a program organized scientist by scientist, uh, for scientists and by scientists, it consists just from the successful work of all of us. And I strongly encourage, and you are strongly encouraged by the organizing committee to highlight the strongest parts of your work when you are giving your presentations and when you are discussing your work with your colleagues as well as the students. So welcome to the TMB 2017. I would like to actually to also return maybe to remind the, one of the first letters which has been sent to me back in 2007 by Evgeny Meshkov. Yes, and I, I'm very glad that now in 2017 this will be the first time when he attends this conference. So, yes. Regarding the uh, formal structure, I kindly, open, kindly ask you to open now the program and to proceed with me such that I could explain which is which, where and how. So we will not have questions anymore. The program, this is the booklet. The program usually lists only the title of the talk and the name of the presenter. The booklet, there is a complete list of the contributors as well as the institution. The booklet, there is a list of authors which you find an appropriate presentation. Presentations here are scheduled as uh, separated by the TMD scenes. They go by the last name. Now, about the conference structure, we follow our standard routine. So essentially, we have our sessions running from 9 to 10. 10 to 10.30, there is a coffee break. Then from 10 to 10.30, 10 to 12.30, there is a two-hour session. Then there is a one hour and a half for lunch. From two there is a coffee break and then there is a concluding session from 4.30 to 6.30. There are actually a few exceptions because while we try to keep the time of the coffee breaks and time of the lunch for the more or less set, they are not set in stone. In fact, we do prefer to, to, for people to spend time of the coffee break maybe as short as 15 minutes. Coffee is available. If you will go to the left hand side, to the first floor, there is a park, and also over there, there is a coffee machine. Now, we will have a parallel session. Mm -hmm. We will have parallel sessions, unfortunately, uh, even though we will try our best not to have them. Yes, I will do it. Thank you so much. We will have parallel sessions. The parallel sessions will not be run, so there will be the sessions that don't have parallel session, like this session. And there will be the sessions that will have a parallel session. So the parallel sessions, they will be scheduled, uh, they are scheduled in earlier lecture hall. So in order to go there, we just need to go from, the, uh, from this uh, hall 
to turn the right and follow the science. It's a smaller lecture hall, however, and the presentations that are scheduled there, they are, as a rule, the, is, there are several sessions which is uh, dedicated to the TMB for use award, as well as there are the sessions where people uh, present a, a longer 25 minutes uh, talks as, as a regular contributions. I kindly, I strongly ask you, especially our invited uh, lecturer, uh, uh, strongly encourage you to attend the TMB for you uh, sessions. They are marked separately in this uh, program. And please let us know your opinion about the works because the students and young researchers, they take the TMB for you competition very seriously. There will be the poster session, which will be in the poster hall around the main lecture hall on Tuesday at 5.30. There will be one public lecture which will be given by Dr. Srinivasan and it will be not only for us, but also ICTP, ICTP White, which will be scheduled, which is scheduled on Wednesday from 2 to 3. And there will be also the round table discussions which will be from 5.30 until 7 p.m. in the Oppenheimer <coughs> room. It's a, those who have attended TMB conferences in the past, you know what it is. It's actually the room that has a real round table. So we will be sitting around this round table. And uh, we will have a banquet from 7 to 9 on Wednesday. And we will also have a reception, farewell reception on Friday from uh, 7 to 9. So I think we are ready to start. And uh, I would like, uh, to, as a con uh, continuity of the session, to, uh, to, to, to invite Professor David Campbell to start his talk. And I kindly point your attention that Professor David Campbell was one of the, at our 2007 conference. Better move it. All set? You reading my title? Yes, <laughs> I'm reading your title. Because uh, these days he will be discussed, uh, the Professor Campbell from, from Boston University will be discussing intermediate mighty body dynamics at, at equilibrium. Thank you, Susanna. Yeah. Thank you for all her. <laughs> so, uh, good morning. Buongiorno, dobre jutro, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, it's a real pleasure to be here uh, to give a talk. Uh, at this uh, turbulent mixing and beyond. Uh, as Susanna said, I gave a talk at the very first conference, and I actually talked on the same subject, the Fermi Postulon problem, uh, though it's not apparent from the title. Uh, what that indicates is not that I'm stuck in one area, but rather that that problem is so important and has been so influential that it's influenced the study of nonlinear dynamics and non equilibrium phenomena since it first started. So let me first mention that this work was done in collaboration with Carlo Daniele and Sergio, Sergi, uh, Sergei Flach and has already been published in FISVERVI. And at the end of the talk, there'll be a short quiz and you're supposed to tell me what those two figures mean. Okay. So I want to talk about the context, which is the uh, equipartition and thermalization in many body systems uh, and it was Focus, I want to focus on the first study that really showed that this might not be a trivial problem, the pioneering work of Fermi, Pasta, Ulam, and the failure to observe equipartition. Uh, from those original simulations, uh, there are four questions that arise immediately. Uh, I will have only time to focus on only one today, but the first is, what are the origin of these Fermi, Fermi Pasta, Ulam recurrences, which I will tell you about? Um, what happens if you crank up the energy density, that is the energy in the lattice per particle, uh, will the original data go to equilibrium? And finally, and this is a subject which is relevant to our non-equilibrium uh, dynamics, uh, how do you find equilibrium and what are the dynamics or what is the dynamics at equilibrium? Um, since I want to make sure I get to the results, you know, independent of time constraints, what we find is that even at equilibrium, the FPU dynamics exhibit uh, very large fluctuations uh, you can call it intermittent dynamics, uh, which are driven by some sort of stickiness due to coherent structures that exist in normal mode space, so-called Q breathers, which I'll explain briefly. And these Q breathers also explain the recurrences. So the dynamics of equilibrium is not trivial, it's quite complicated. Um, 
thanks to a referee who challenged whether our results were general, we were able to show that in the Klein-Gordon system, which has a different form of nonlinearity, again, these coherent structures cause sticky dynamics, and these are intrinsic localized modes. So this is what I hope to cover in the next uh, 35 minutes. So here are the three gentlemen, uh, Fermi, Pasta, and Ulam. Uh, in 53, working at Los Alamos with a machine called the Maniac for mathematical analyzer, numerical integrator, and computer, uh, they tried to study the question of how equipartition and thermalization occur in a very simple classical nonlinear dynamical systems. Now, for those of you who have seen the movie Hidden Figures or know the book Hidden Figures, this is the hidden figure in the FPU problem. Mary Tsingle Menso, she was Mary Tsingle then, she actually wrote the code that they ran. Uh, and there's a great article by uh, Thierry Dachois in Physics Today describing her role. Uh, the hidden figures, were, of course, were the, the computers, the African-American women who worked in the space program, but she was a hidden figure in the FPU problem. So this is a, a picture of the original LA uh, UR print, pre uh, preprint the lab from Los Alamos National Laboratory. I actually had the last paper copy that they distributed. Uh, fortunately, I made copies of it before somebody took it. So here's the original preprint. Uh, studies of nonlinear problems one, you'll notice that. Uh, here are uh, the authors, and you'll notice that they're Fermi, Pasta, and Ulam, and there is Mary Tsingal. She did the work, but she didn't write the report out, so it's the FPU problem. This is the abstract from that, that paper, and the important thing here is to notice that the key conclusion is the results show ve very little, if any, tendency toward equal partition of energy among degrees of freedom. This system did not go to thermal equilibrium, did not go to equal partition, and the question was why. And of course, the fact there were no further studies is sadly related to the fact that Fermi died in, in 54, uh, and uh, therefore the work was not continued. I won't go through the whole preprint, but I want to call out a couple of things. Here, notice the, uh, <coughs> the aim of establishing experimentally the rate of approach uh, to the equal partition of energy among the various degrees of freedoms. This is experimental mathematics. This is the first time, really, that a computer was used to study an analytic problem that was un 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 untouchable, sorry, a problem that was untouchable analytically. And let me read you, if I can here, what uh, von Neumann said. Our present analytic methods seem unsuitable for the solution of important problems arising in connection with nonlinear partial differential equations, and in fact, with virtually all problems in pure mathematics. Really efficient high-speed computing devices may, in the field of nonlinear partial differential equations, as well as many other fields, which we now are difficult or entirely denied of access, provide us with those heuristic hints which are needed in all parts of mathematics for genuine progress. So von Neumann wrote that in 1947. He knew the purpose of computing was not numbers, but insight. And one final point here, notice that at least uh, Mary Tsingo got uh, an acknowledgment for the work she did in coding the problem. OK, so how many people actually know in detail what the FPU problem was? Wow, two hands. OK, I'm glad I have, I am very glad I put in this introduction. <laughs> so this is the FPU problem. It's a nonlinear chain, so I should say sorry. It's a chain of masses coupled by nonlinear springs. So this is a, so we have, 1 to n, fixed walls, and they studied n equals 32 and 64, uh, mass m coupled by potential v. And of course, v, the simple term here is Hooke's law, linear restoring force. But these cubic and quartic terms are nonlinear terms. Now, FPU knew, it's easy to prove, that if you have only the linear term, the system can never go to equilibrium. You know that. You analyze, Fourier analyzed initial state. The Fourier coefficients stay the same. They just rotate with phases. So you'll never have go to equilibrium. They knew that. But they thought that adding this nonlinearity would lead to uh, immediate, almost immediate, equilibration. And this is a quote that Ulam wrote in Fermi's Selected Works. Um, I'll take, you can read it yourself. But the point is, what they found was a very surprising result to Fermi. And he, he called it a little discovery. Uh, in providing limitation in the belief that any kind of mixing and thermalization uh, would happen as soon as you put in nonlinearity, and this did not happen. So what actually did happen, and how we study it? 
Well, typically, we would study a system starting from its linear limit. So the two coefficients from the cubic and quartic terms are set equal to 0. Uh, we then get a simple equation of motion, which we all reckon linear. This is the linear phonon dis uh, dispersion relation from solid state physics. And if we look at assuming that yn has this form, we put in a lot of spacing for convenience, then provided that we have this dispersion relation relating omega, the frequencies, to k, the normal modes or, or momenta, uh, if we have this dispersion relation, this problem can be solved. So now, if we have a weak nonlinearity, alpha, let's look at only alpha, beta zero, and we expand in terms of normal modes, then this separates the problem into weakly coupled harmonic oscillators. Here are the harmonic oscillators. Omega k has that sine dependence, so these are uncoupled. And here's alpha, and these are coupling coefficients which can be calculated that couple the normal modes. So for stronger nonlinearity, FPU uh, expected that whatever the initial conditions, the normal modes would share the energy equally over time. And so the question is, what actually happened? So for n equals 32, I'm going to show you some results of the so-called alpha model excited in the lowest normal mode. Only the fewest, low, few lowest modes were excited. In fact, in the FPU problem, only modes 1 to 5 were excited. So this is data from the original study, hand plotted, reprinted in Fermi's Collected Works. And it's a little hard to see, especially from the back, so let me walk you through it. This is the initial state. All the energy is in the lowest mode, the simple sine mode that goes to 0 at both ends. Starts there. It suddenly, uh, not suddenly, Precipitously, this falls down. Mode 2 starts up, mode 3, mode 5. Looks like mode 4 comes biggest here, then mode 3, and then mode 2, and then mode 3, mode 4. And then we come back to where mode 1 comes almost back to its initial state. This is in a very short period of time. You can't read this, but this says n equals 32 parameters. Alpha is a quarter, and the delta t squared for the numerics was 1 eighth. So you see what we have are recurrences in the FPU problem. This is the same problem, but this has alpha equals 1, so it's a stronger nonlinearity. You would expect this, for, therefore, would go more, more quickly to, to equi equal partition equilibrium. In fact, the repeat cycle, the Fermi postulum recurrence, is much closer in time, comes sooner. So, and these recurrences are to 97% initial energy is back in the initial state. Now, if, in case anybody's wondering whether this is a Poincaré recurrence in a nonlinear dynamical system, the Poincaré recurrence is somewhere over in Slovenia. Okay, so this is a very, very surprising result, a shocking result. It really is if, uh, if had you, uh, if you showed a movie of a glass of water having been poured out, reassembling in the glass, so they're going back to the initial state. Now, maybe they didn't run it long enough. So in fact, later, uh, Tuck and now Mary Menzel, Mary and Sigmund Menzel, published the result themselves. They ran the FPU alpha problem much longer. And what they found was not an approach to equilibrium, but a super recurrence. So instead of having 97% of the energy back in the initial state, in a finite time, much shorter than the Poincaré recurrence time, they went to almost 99%. So these FPU recurrences were a huge surprise. They actually led to the whole development of nonlinear science, to the development of the concept of solitons and Hamiltonian chaos from this. I don't have time to go into that in detail, but I will say that the FPU dynamics <coughs> in were, uh, in, well, so the point is they didn't observe the partition. The energy stays localized. Uh, these, unfortunately, uh, thanks to Bill Gates, my simulations here are not active in the actual PowerPoint presentation. So what I'll do if I have time later on is show you some actual time evolutions of the motion in normal mode space and the motion in real space. And, uh, <coughs> and, and you'll see that these things stay localized in normal mode space. So here are the three questions, or three of the four, that I mentioned before. What is the origin of the FPU recurrences? Uh, most people are familiar with the ideas of Zabuski and Kruskal, who in 1965 
actually developing the word soliton showed that the FPU problem was closely related if you took a continuum limit to the Cordovec de Vries equation, which is completely integrable. So in that sense, the fermi postulon problem was in some sense for low energies close to an integrable system, and that's why it didn't go to equilibrium. Actually, a more precise explanation is due to Flock and his collaborators in 2005, so-called Q breathers. These are linearly stable, coherent structures in the FPU system in momentum space, in normal mode space. So periodic motions in normal mode space that are linearly stable. And they actually explain the recurrences uh, quantitatively in terms of times, how, when they occur. A good question is, what happens as you increase energy? Uh, it turns out uh, that's well studied. Uh, this was the original work by Israelis and Chirikov in 65, which led to uh, using the Chirikov overlap criterion, led to uh, the understanding of when you should have stochasticity and approach to equal, equal partition in FPU. Uh, and then there have been many, many studies uh, taking the original FPU data, not increasing the energy. Original FPU data, will the fermi postulon problem reach equilibrium? And there are uh, a huge number of studies. The answer seems to be yes, but on an exceptionally long time scale. So now let me give you the warning, because it's easy to confuse. These so-called Q-breathers have nothing to do with quantum mechanics. They are coherent structures that are localized, typically exponentially, in normal mode space around some particular normal mode. So they're exact solutions, periodic solutions, uh, linearly stable around, that involve some modes around a normal mode, but are exponentially localized around that mode. OK. So now let's do some serious work trying to see how we define equilibrium in the FPU problem and how we would approach it. Well, equal partition means that all the modes must have the same energy on the time average, obviously not instantaneously, but over time, the average will be the same. So here is the energy in a normal mode, its momentum and its, uh, its frequency times its location. Our frequencies have the same, uh, uh, the same uh, structure as before. This is the uh, energy of an individual mode compared to the total, nu k. So we will track two variables, the participation ratio, which just is the inverse of the sum of these squares. This tells you how the energy is divided up among the different modes. If they're all equal, then the participation ratio takes a simple sign, simple structure. And then a logarithmic-like quantity, uh, sorry, an entropy-like quantity, which is defined by S of t, which is nu log nu. And we'll look at the normalized version of that, which is S of t minus S max uh, divided by that. Eta is defined as uh, limited between 0 and 1 by its definition. So these two things are going to be our measure of whether we're at equilibrium. Now, what do we mean by equilibrium? What we mean is that the averages exist. This is our definition of it. You can argue about, that, about this, but this is a standard definition. That the averages exist and that they can be computed from the Gibbs distribution. So I won't go through the details. I have it on slides if people want to see the gruesome details. But if you calculate these quantities, p and eta, for a Gibbs distribution, then you find that eta is 1 minus the Euler constant over the log of the number of particles in the system minus s0. And the inverse participation ratio is 2 over n, where n is the number of particles in the system. So, Question, of course. Sorry, I couldn't hear. Yeah. Yes? Where is what? Beta, you temperature? No. no. OK, so this is a, sorry, this is a confusion anymore. This beta is 1 over K, uh, KT. The other beta, it doesn't have to appear. It doesn't have to appear. You have to do the calculation. You know, oh, I can show you the calculation. But you know the fact that a system could go to equilibrium at any temperature, right? Any, any temperature you can define equilibrium. And if you define equilibrium in terms of the values of these two variables in a Gibbs ensemble, you get, these, you get those results. Beta is zero. Beta is zero, that's infinite temperature. That, 
Infinite temperature may be an exception, but I, I, I show you the calculation. It's surprising, but if you think about it, at any temperature, a system can go to equilibrium. That's the point. And this is the result for the FPU problem, independent of temperature. Sorry? For this classic system. For the selected? Yeah. Yeah. For the, I mean, you, you could define the same thing for 5 fourths. The point is, if you define these quantities, this is a participation ratio of the individual energies relative to the total. And this is, a, this is a, 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 an entropy which was first used in the 90s by Cassetti and Pono and, and uh, the Italian groups. Uh, you will find, just by straightforward calculation, that those are the values. I admit it's surprising. But if you think about the fact you know a system can go to equilibrium at any, any temperature, then it's not so surprising. I'll show you the gory details in private, you know. So assuming that's true, let's consider the, manimals, the manifolds on which eta and p, the averages over time, achieve their equilibrium values, which we'll call Fn, f of eta and f of p. Now these manifolds are co-dimension one manifolds. So they're generalized ergodic Poincaré sections. And what happens as a given uh, dynamical trajectory moves through this very high dimensional phase space, n equals 32, 64 dimensional phase space, it will pierce this ma these manifolds an infinite number of times as the, the trajectory goes to infinity. The time intervals between the piercings will contain information on whether and when the dynamics visits a sticky region of phase space. If you have a very long time interval, interval between two, two passages, you know you've gotten stuck somewhere away from, from equilibrium. So there's something sticky out there. In the original FPU problem, n equals 32, uh, eta should have this value, 0.1218, and 1 over p is, uh, uh, is uh, n over 2, so it's 16. So these are the values that we should see if we run an FPU simulation to equilibrium if it had equilibrium, right? Everybody clear on this? Because otherwise, I've lost you, right? OK. Oh, yes, the next slide takes a long time to come up because the, uh, it's, it's printed in uh, details. So these are actual, run, from our runs, of the values of eta instantaneously and p. Instantaneous values are shown in black, which is why that slide took so long to come up, because it's a bitmap. The average values of time over a time window are shown in red. And you see that eta, you can show it starts at 1, and, and, and p starts at 1, <coughs> comes down over time, and the average eventually goes to this value, which is, in fact, this dotted line is the 0 0.1218 0 value. OK? p goes up to 16. You can see that. The different colors are for different values of epsilon. Remember, epsilon is the energy density, the energy that you put in the total system divided by the number of, of particles. And FPU energy is, was very small. For larger epsilon, you put more energy in the system, it goes faster and faster to the equilibrium value, right? That's the blue curve, and the red curve, and the green curve. You see small fluctuations around equilibrium. And the magenta curve, this is log 10 in time scale, so this is 10 to the 10th units. And the FPU epsilon is four times smaller than this epsilon here in magenta. So it's way out here when it will finally approach equilibrium. Here's actually a calculation of the time to equal partition using the, the T eta. This is the eta variable going to its equilibrium value versus epsilon. So here's epsilon in, in a log of epsilon. The open circles are data from, well, I mean, not do that yet, are data from a paper of Cassetti et al. Uh, I'll show you the reference in a minute. Uh, they sort of predicted that FPU would be 10 to the 11th. If you extrapolate this curve, you get 10 to the 11th. The black field data, uh, black field circles are our data. Again, we find that our guess is that TFPU is 10 to the 15th, which actually would be, uh, to get, actually, to get to that value, would require, depending on how you do it, between 14 and 80 years on our CPU or three months to a year on a GPU cluster. These are very, very, very long time scales. And that's, of course, assuming that there isn't another, see, this is the vertical, this is the value 
of the FPU value of epsilon, what they actually studied is out here. And you see it's going to be at least 10 to the 14th. Uh, and notice that there is a kink in the slope that uh, Kazati et al. did not see right here at about point, point 0.01, which makes our data go, uh, arise faster. And we can't say for sure that there isn't another kink there. So the ecopartition time uh, is well beyond the scope of current calculations when you take the value that FPU used. Now, of course, going back to this picture, so we'll come back. Yeah, oh, come on back. Well, I'll ask you to remember the picture where we've, we saw that, that uh, as you increased epsilon, you went fast to equilibrium. This is the uh, Cazetti et al. Uh, reference. It's a central reference in this field. Anybody wants to copy it down, I'll leave it up for a couple more seconds. So the message is, it does look like FPU could tend to equilibrium, but the, one of the initial important calculations grossly mis, uh, underestimated the equilibrium time, and uh, it looks like it's a lot longer. OK. So this is probably uh, uh, one of the two most important slides in my talk for the new results. Uh, what we see here are the time intervals. These are the time intervals between subsequent piercings of the manifold. Remember I said you had this manifold, the orbit moves around, and it pierces it. These are the time intervals. This is the interval number. So T1, T2, T3, T4. And you can see that there are long excursions in phase space. So here's an interval. Uh, this, is, this is in time. This is the value of eta. And you see that here's the equilibrium value for this whole long time period, which is of order 10 to the 6th, 10 to the 5th, the system is out of equilibrium or away from its equilibrium value. Okay. Question? OK, so if you plot the um, distribution functions for the return times uh, of eta as a function uh, of r, of t, you find that you find a power law tail for this distribution. This is a, this is a fit of the power law, which depends on epsilon. So for, for, small, for large values of epsilon, it falls off rather rapidly. So it, you, you don't go away from equilibrium very long. Uh, and uh, if, the, if the, the first moment is finite, but the second moment, moment diverges if, uh, if uh, gamma is uh, too small. This is also true in the correlation functions. Now, the difference between the red curve, which is where you have eta above equilibrium value, and the blue curve, where eta is below its equilibrium value, is pretty obvious uh, physically. Namely, it's much more likely the system will be away from equilibrium than more equilibrated. This is more equilibrated than the, the value of eta you expect. It's naive, the thing that Cosetti did, they assumed eta equals 0 was what they were looking for. And that's not correct. It's, a, it's a, the 0.1218 value. So what is the origin of this stickiness? Here's an example of the in normal mode space. So there are 32 normal modes, 1 to 32. Here's the time. And here's what you see excited. You see strong localization in normal mode space around a high value of k. This is for a, a epsilon fairly, uh, fairly reasonable. And there's a definite localization in normal mode space. I mean, the scale is such that the light colors are way up here at the top, indicating that the energy is highly localized in one of these cube readers. There are similar results uh, for phi fourth. Classical phi fourth field theory uh, on a lattice obeys this equation. Notice that the nonlinearity here is what we call on site. It doesn't depend on the dif difference between two sites, but is on site. So it's a different kind of nonlinearity. So it's a different system. In this system, uh, this supports so called intrinsic localized modes or discrete breathers. Here's a picture from an article that Sergei Flach, Yuri Kipshar, and I wrote for Physics Today. And I'll, I'll go through it in some detail. What you see here is the 5 fourth equation for a certain value of delta x. I think it's actually delta x equals 10. Uh, so it's a very large value. Uh, I should say, obviously, as delta x goes to 0, this becomes a continuum equation. This is just the discrete version of the second derivative. So it's a partial differential equation. But for large delta x, this is a coupled lattice problem, like the um, FPU problem. And here is the region 
uh, as n goes to infinity, this region becomes dense with a phonon spectrum, and this is a phonon spectrum. Uh, it has a finite mass gap uh, from about the square root of 2 to uh, the square root of 2 plus 1 over 10 squared square root. So there's a finite region in which the phonons can exist. Is everybody happy with that? These are the, these are the localized, these are, sorry, these are delocalized linear excitations. And these arrows here are what's called omega breather. These are the breather frequencies. And what you see here are two kinds of breathers. Stare at these for a minute and tell me what you think the characteristic of this breather is and the characteristic of that breather. So in this one, nearby, these, this, what do I mean by that? This is the amplitude of the, the solution at this n equals 0. Here is the next neighbor site, next neighbor, and then 0 beyond that. Here's another one, amplitude at two sites, here, here. What you see here is an optical-like alternating discrete breather, which has a frequency above the continuum here and an acoustic breather, which has a frequency below the, 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 uh, the continuum. These are discrete systems. They are localized, exponentially localized in, on the lattice. Now, notice that if this frequency, which is about 1.3, is below the, the continuum, and all harmonics of it are above the continuum, there's no way it can couple and it can't decay. So this is a stable, localized mode in 5 fourth. Similarly, this state is already above the continuum, so all its harmonics are above it, so it can't decay. So these are stable modes and exist actually in any spatial dimension. If we actually do the same simulations, like uh, as in the FPU case for the 5 fourth case, we see the strong organization now in real space. So this is now lattice sites 1 to 32. And we see that in this case, there is a normal mode at about n equals 22 that has most of the energy and exists there for quite a long time. And again, the, the PDF of the distribution is power law. Uh, this time, uh, as epsilon increases, uh, it, it gets smaller. But the result is the same in terms of localization, that there are these localized excitations, either in normal mode space, the Q breathers, or in real space, the continuum, uh, the 5 fourth breathers, which uh, account for the stickiness and the de uh, deviation from simple dynamics at equilibrium. So let me summarize. I'm going to finish on time, maybe a little ahead. Um, I introduced the idea, maybe a, bit, a little too fast, of the famous fermi pasta recurrences and the FPU paradox, namely that the system did not go to equilibrium. We gave a natural uh, definition of equilibrium in terms of the observables. Uh, and whose behavior can be followed in time. That's very important. Both eta and p, we can calculate them at any time on any trajectory, and so we know their values. And we found that they go to an equilibrium value, but when they go to that equilibrium value, there are non-trivial intermediate dynamics where the system deviates, goes off equilibrium for quite a bit of time, and that's due to stickiness of orbits that are related to locally stable coherent structures in both the fermi pasta ulam case and 5 fourth. Um, we've actually tested this method with other observables and can be extended to other models. And so what we have actually is a new quantitative way to probe out of equilibrium dynamics and the relaxation to equilibrium uh, in high dimensional nonlinear dynamical systems. Uh, here again is the reference. And with that, I'll thank you and uh, thank my collaborators, uh, Carlo and Sergio. Sergey, thank you.